Ladies and gentlemen, as I said, my name is Professor Morgan Smythe Sagnuson. I was named for a distant cousin who left for the colonies many, many years ago. In fact, his, he was born in the colonies. His father left for there. They settled west of the Alleghenies and made their fortune in petroleum. Henry Style, or Henry Smith, Reverend Style, you're in my mind again. Henry Smythe and his wife had one son, Morgan. Now, like the gentleman of his age, Morgan went off to school and became a great hunter. He was worked in circles with men like Roosevelt, Morgan, Mellon, Vanderbilt, Carnegie. Cousin Morgan became a great hunter like they did, although while his friends hunted large game, Cousin Morgan preferred little game. Cousin Morgan liked things with six legs, and eight legs, and a hundred legs, and many more legs than God gave any righteous animal. In short, my friends, Cousin Morgan collected bugs. Insects. He traveled the globe looking for insects. In a lot of ways, Dr. Smythe was ahead of his time. For not only did he collect bugs, he also talked to the local people. He learned their legend, their lore. He learned what they knew about the insects around them. And it was through this work that he came in contact with a member of the scarab family. Now this particular scarab beetle lived in an area of Africa that was prone to drought. And when the droughts would come, it would secrete a red, sticky, thick, viscous liquid that would harden into a shell around it and protect it through the drought. When the moistures came again, it would re-solidify, reviving not only the insect within, but providing it nourishment to get started once again in life. It was through the use of this scarab juice, now, my cousin Morgan gave it a very large, long scientific name, which I have never bothered to learn. But it was through this sticky, red, vis viscous liquid that Professor Smythe was able to assemble his collection and bring it back to Smythe Hall, which he had inherited with the death of his parents. He soon converted Smythe Hall for his researches. He lived in a very small wing of the house. Smythe Hall was a large pile of a place. The rest of the house went over to the insects, some of them still encased in this, well, one of his students called it bug juice. A silly name perhaps, but it was certainly easier to pronounce than that long Latin thing that he had given it. And that student was one of countless entomologists who came to study and work with my cousin. My cousin lived for many, many years. In fact, it was in the early 1960s that he celebrated his 96th birthday. Now, aside from those of us on the eastern side of the Atlantic, Cousin Morgan had a few distant cousins on the far western edge of the continent who had decided that he had lived well past his lifespan and should hurry up and die and give them what was left of the fortune. To that end, they took Cousin Morgan to court and they filed well, the papers they filed challenged his sanity. To those of us in the Pax Britannia, he would have merely been an eccentric. But even an eccentric does not please the court when he does not show up for his court date. Cousin Morgan rarely left the house. True, there were professors who argued the case for him, but to no avail. The court reached a compromise and appointed a nurse to make sure that he took his vitamins and ate his vegetables and put himself into bed at a reasonable hour. This was the last straw for my cousin. 
The night before the nurse was to arrive, it is assumed that he broke several vials of blood, uh, blood juice and soaked the walls and floor of his room, the bedchamber he slept in. He also broke many, many cases that contained insisted insects. These he scattered across his room and turned on the sink, plugging the drain. He went to bed. In the morning, the nurse, well, she had the shortest term of employment in history. It didn't last very long for her. She opened the door to the bedchamber to find a writhing carpet and wall covering. It swayed, it moved, it creaked, it cracked, it chittered, it clicked. This wall covering was made up of insects from all over the world. There were crickets, there were snails, there were slugs, there were ants, there were spiders, there were millipedes, there were centipedes, there were what have you peas, and they were crawling and writhing. When they finally got the insects cleaned out, all they found of my cousin was some of his hair, his bones, and the rings on his fingers. He had left a note. He said, to my cousins, you may have my bones and their weight in gold, but the rest of the fortune and smite all goes to my work. Friends, that should have been the end of it, but of course, it wound up back in the courts again. It was almost another 10 years before a decision had been reached. Most of the fortune went to preserve Smythe Hall and continue Cousin Morgan's work. The heirs got some, but there was still the question of the bedchamber, the sitting room, and the small kitchen that Cousin Morgan had inhabited. It had not been touched in over 10 years. The university decided the easiest way to clean it was to have some of their children, young teenagers, clean it for them. That way it would not cost them anything. Friends, this was the early 70s. The area of such cinematic classics as the Amityville Horror, The Exorcist, and several others, these preteens were very happy to do the cleaning for a chance to spend the night in a haunted house. Well, the cleaning went quickly, aside from the bedchamber. The bedchamber was still covered in that red, sticky bug juice. The boys had figured it out, they just sloshed water on it. And after a couple of hours, came back and scraped off what they could of the sludge sloshed some more water on it and repeated until the walls and the floor were clean. At which point their merriments began. After their merriments, they bedded down for the evening. The girls elected to sleep in Cousin Morgan's bedchamber. The boys in the sitting room. All went well until about perhaps 1.30, 2 o'clock. One of the boys awoke, gasping for breath. He reached for his inhaler, for he knew what had happened. He had been bitten by a spider. Having puffed on the inhaler, he looked down and saw several spiders on him. This prompted a very comical, very quick, very jerky dance out of the lab. Accompanied by his screams, his screams woke up the other teens. And then the screaming began in earnest. Imagine, if you will, the fright of those young girls to wake pinned in their sleeping bags, adrift in a sea that was not really water, but their hair flowing out from their heads as the bugs crawled through it. The centipedes, the millipedes, the spiders, the ants, the crickets, the scarabs, the tarantulas, swaying back and forth. It said some went in ears and mouths and up the noses of some of these girls. Well, 
I will be honest with you, friends. The children all survived, and it was very hushed up and taken care of. In time, it has been forgotten. Except, I hear now the university which owns Smythe Hall has decided they need to increase their coffers and have once again decided that perhaps, just perhaps, they should offer haunted sleepovers in Smythe Hall. And friends, I have to wonder, should I tell them about the bugs? Anyone care to join me in my repast? 